My name is Marina Rusto. I'm a professor of Near Eastern Studies and History, and I direct the Princeton Geniza Lab. If you ever plan on living in Cairo in the year 1000, there are some things you need to know. You won't have to think about breakfast. You'll eat in the late morning and the late afternoon, two meals a day. You won't have to cook unless you're getting paid to do it. You'll buy your meals at the bazaar, warm, and carry them home in a metal carrier. Why, you ask? Because the last place you want to build a fire is your house. Your house is 1 24th or some equally absurd fraction of what's called a dar in Arabic, a multi-story residential compound arranged around a courtyard. Having an open fire there, which you would need to do in order to cook, risks incinerating yourself and your neighbors, which you may, granted, want to do at points, but generally not a good idea. Okay, so what if you own the entire dar? In that case, you're probably wealthy enough to have a kitchen and a staff to use it, so you still don't cook, and congratulations, you get room service. So either way, you're not going to cook at home, and you won't cook at all unless it's your job to cook, with one exception, and that's bread. Your courtyard may have at its center a domed mud brick oven, a tanur, where you and your neighbors can bake bread. So try to stay on friendly terms with them, which won't always be easy since your neighbors are likely to be your in-laws. Their surviving documentation suggests that in-laws could be invasive and controlling. If you had wise aunties who took control of your marriage negotiations, your in-laws might be legally obliged to stay out of your business. If not, well, you can always bring your dough to the communal oven. If you ever plan on living in medieval Cairo, here's another thing you should know. Don't try to carve rock crystal unless you've been trained to carve rock crystal. Rock crystal is a type of quartz that you and everyone else covet for its flawless transparency. You won't have been trained to carve rock crystal unless you got trained to do it as a child shortly after learning how to walk and talk. Here's how that works. Let's say your uncle runs a rock crystal carving workshop. He'll send one of his trading partners on a sea voyage to buy hunks of rock crystal. There were mines in South Asia, in East Africa, and possibly in Central Asia. We don't know exactly where the raw materials came from, but let's go with Sri Lanka, which medieval Arabs called Silan, which is where the word Salon comes from, or Madagascar, in which case your uncle's trading partner is going to sail up the Nile. Then he'll go on foot overland to the Red Sea coast. That's to avoid the Northern Red Sea, which has some bad coral reefs and some difficult winds. So then he'll catch a boat down the rest of the Red Sea, past the Dahlak archipelago off the coast of Eritrea. Then he'll go through the mouth of the Red Sea to the Great Sea, which we would call the Indian Ocean, and then went by a few different names, Bahar al-Hind, which is basically Indian Ocean, Bahar al-Malibari, which is the Malabar Sea. And then assuming that it's the proper half of the monsoon season, he'll sail to points south or east where he'll buy some gleaming hunks of rock crystal. Now, it won't be a pleasant voyage. A trader 100 years later, around 1100, would grumble about it so passionately that he decided to set his complaints to his brother back home in verse. He called the city of Aydab, a city of Aydab, tribulations. He called the town of Sawakin a most frightening place, a Khad Amakin. He called Badia, uh, which is a small town that we like barely know anything about, the most bitter, terrifying, miserable of places. And he called the entire Dahlak archipelago, which housed one of the greatest ports that he would pass on the journey, a ruinous land. So Dahlak was a balad muhlik, a ruinous land. Whether that was because the customs tolls were extortionate or he just didn't like the food, we'll never know. So even though the words I just quoted from this letter are in Arabic, you may have noticed that the script is in Hebrew. That's because it was written by a Jewish trader, in this case, someone from Libya, and the most common language of the Jews in the Middle Ages was Judeo-Arabic, which is the Arabic language written in Hebrew characters. But for our Libyan who wrote this letter, the difficulties were only beginning because once he left the Red Sea, he tells us, he had to embark on a different type of ship, which he describes as containing not a single nail of iron, but rather as being tied together with ropes. May God protect us with his shield. In fact, that was how Indian Ocean ships were built. The planks were tied together with ropes spun from coconut choir, which resists seawater very nicely and was also used as ropes for rigging. But you'd have no reason to know that if you were a Mediterranean man who's only sailed on boats held together with nails. So the guy was scared, but not so scared that he couldn't express his fear in rhyme. Okay, but back to your uncle's trade partner. It would take him two years minimum to return from his distant lands and he's got an impressive cargo with gleaming hunks of clear quartz so now all you need are some diamond tip tools, if you can afford them. The hardness of rock crystal rates at seven on the Mohs scale, so you need something harder to carve it. Diamond is usually a good bet, but even with a diamond tool or diamond powder ground in with a metal lathe, it would have required hundreds of hours to shape rock crystal. 
First, you make the rough cut, then you hollow out the vessel, and then, most spectacularly of all, you carve and polish the surface. This is what the process looked like in a South Asian manuscript from around 1600. Here's what it looked like when my students tried it last February, right before the pandemic hit. In fact, it may have been our catastrophically unsuccessful efforts to carve our crystal that caused the pandemic in the first place. We're not sure, though this group got further than the year before. Anyway, you know from your uncle, and I can confirm from hard personal experience, that turning rock crystal into anything recognizable requires two things, uncommon upper body strength and equally uncommon steadiness of hand. The upper body strength is for operating the bow lathe. The steady hand is to hold the rock crystal still while the carving wheel turns. It's kind of like using a violin bow to operate a potter's wheel, and it's about as awkward. So after some months of labor, possibly years, the experts at your uncle's shop might turn out something like this a chess piece from 10th century Egypt. But if you wanted something like this, a gorgeous rock crystal ewer, you had to pay a king's ransom. In fact, this rock crystal ewer was carved for a late 10th century Egyptian caliph, and it's a spectacular piece of craftsmanship. Its walls are between two and six millimeters thick. It even contains an elaborate visual joke. Within each of the spots of the cheetah, as well as on the links of the chain around the cheetah's neck, there's a mini cheetah so small that no modern person actually noticed it until Jeremy Johns and Elise Morero at Oxford examined it with a digital microscope and spotted it. Spotted it, get it? So asking you or my students to carve a rock crystal ewer is like handing you a Stradivarius and asking you to play a Bach partita. If you haven't been studying violin since you were four years old and devoting a considerable number of hours to the instrument on a daily basis for the duration of your childhood, the results are not likely to be publicly presentable. Hence the need for very, very young apprentices. It's actually fascinating because in our educational system where we learn to read and write very early and nearly universally, there are very few other skills that we learn that you need to start early in life. One of them is music, which is really one of the last remnants of a craft where if you don't start it super early, like you're sunk. In the Middle Ages, all the crafts were like that. You started super young, otherwise you were never gonna excel at it. So you need very young apprentices in a rock crystal carving workshop. So, but as a medieval Kyrene, you're living in a city of half a million or more. So you're bound to find at least one person whose father lacks more ambitious plans for him, who has hands as steady as a surgeon's, eyes as sharp as a jeweler's, and the strength of a stevedore. It's complicated. Okay, so are you ready to settle for ceramic yet? I thought so. There's a reason ceramic is a heck of a lot cheaper than rock crystal. So those are some of the things that you shouldn't try to do, cook at home or carve rock crystal. You also shouldn't expect a formal education unless you're male and relatively well off, though some women learn to read and write. But regardless, many women and most men heard more books than they read because literature was not really for reading, it was for listening. So don't expect a formal education, but that said, the informal education is all around you. For instance, if you happen to pass by a shadow play being performed, stop and watch it. The puppets are made of leather and held on sticks behind a screen, which is backlit by torches. You'll be standing in front of the screen with a large crowd at rapt attention, as I was when my students reenacted a shadow play from 14th century Cairo. The play will be staged not in a Princeton auditorium, but in a public square in front of a sultan's mausoleum. And the show will go on despite the prohibitions of scandalized religious experts, muftis and qadis, whose job is to find such performances morally reprehensible. Are they morally reprehensible? That depends on your point of view and whether you have a problem watching characters who are sex workers, pimps, professional gamblers, thieves, hashish addicts, and God forbid, tax collectors. The Qadi won't be there watching, obviously, so you can enjoy hearing the characters proclaim blasphemies and body jokes to your heart's content and theirs. If that sounds kind of salty to you though, I need to warn you, the choicest, most morally subversive lines will be in a register of Arabic so refined and erudite that unless you've heard or read quite a bit of literature yourself, you won't understand them. But if you happen to have spent time studying or better yet compiling Arabic dictionaries, you'll be able to follow all the words because words were to medieval Arabic what tulips were to 17th century Amsterdam, a highly coveted luxury good, a collector's item and a status symbol. But if you're not so erudite and you can't follow the double entendre, you can go find yourself some uncles and ask them to explain. They'll forgive you the indiscretion because they've been there before you. Keep your wits about you though. The audience is likely to be comprised not only of wholesomely curious people like you who came just for the wordplay, but also individuals as morally questionable as the characters on the stage. There will be pickpocketing. Leave your money pouch at home, minus the few dirhams you'll need to tip the puppet master, which you should in fact bring and tuck into your belt because it's your job to fill the puppet master's purse with silver coins 
just as it's his to fill your mind with blasphemy, filth, and mirth, provided that it's followed by a wholesome and redemptive ending in which the previously drunken and debauched main character returns to the Sirat al-Mustaqim, the straight path, finds God, and makes the pilgrimage to Mecca, as the main character often does. So once he does, you'll be free to head to the market for a warm supper. Your day in Cairo has gone well. You can unfurl your sleeping mat with satisfaction, but you still have one further challenge to face. When you return from medieval Egypt, your 21st century friends will ask you questions that you'll find perplexing, even condescending. They'll imagine that you've spent the day in a place that's technologically primitive and religiously fanatical. So you'll have to explain to them with even greater condescension and an ostentatious show of patience that in fact, it was neither. And it's my job to help you make the case. I mean, it's literally my job. I'm a historian of the medieval Middle East. So don't be put off by the term medieval. It's not just for Europeans anymore. And by using it, you're not saying that you believe everything between the fall of Rome and the Italian Renaissance was a vast bleak parenthesis. The term Middle East also has a shady history. It's a colonial term. So it's an anachronism when you're talking about the Middle Ages. I'd prefer to say that I researched the history of the Mediterranean and Western Central Asia, but that's a bit of a mouthful. So I almost never do. I'm a historian of the medieval Middle East, but a particular type of historian, I'm a social historian, which means that I research what ordinary people did on an average day, not what exceptionally powerful men did in a professional capacity or what happened to get recorded by exceptionally literate men. I research the history of the ordinary of ordinary people, of craftspeople, traders, women, children, the poor, rather than caliphs and generals. Although I'm pretty interested in caliphs and generals too, because even they have a social history. So I do history from below, but despite this, I've never felt more that what I do for a living is historically grounded escapism. There are many who malign the medieval period by equating it with barbarism. They're probably thinking of Christian Europe, not the Islamic world, but there are those who malign the Islamic world too, as we all have probably observed. So go ahead and admit it. You've probably used the phrase medieval torture device yourself without giving it too much thought or read something recently that referred to quote unquote medieval levels of brutality. So let's think about that for a minute. Are we forgetting that the bloodiest century in human history was the 20th? Only in the 20th century did humans develop automatic weapons and industrialized incarceration and murder. Totalitarianism, to state the obvious, is a modern phenomenon. All states attempt to monopolize the legitimate means of coercion. And plenty of states are majority stakeholders in illegitimate means of coercion but only in the 20th century have states deployed industrial violence in the service of coercion. Neither medieval Europe nor the medieval Middle East produced anything close to a totalitarian regime. Even absolutism was rarely within the reach of real states, 18th century European monarchs included. Dictatorial powers would have been the wild fantasy of many rulers, but it was rarely a reality and never a reality on the scale of a whole kingdom. The population of the planet in the year 1000 was somewhere between 250 and 350 million people, depending on who you ask, million, okay? So somewhere between the population of the US and Indonesia today. That many people were spread across the entire globe. People were thin on the ground, communications were slow and controlling people en masse was virtually impossible. There were even multiple competing legal systems, many of which predated whatever state happened to be ruling and many of which also persisted after those states fall. So people found ways to use multiple legal systems to their advantage, which is where history from below comes in. So anyone who equates the medieval period with violence and barbarism probably hasn't studied modern history. In fact, it's only in the period just before our own, the 19th century, that our ancestors perpetrated myths about the medieval period that have tarnished the word medieval. It's a myth that medieval people love torture devices. It was 19th century Europeans who were obsessed with devices like the Iron Maiden and the chastity belt but attributed their existence to the Middle Ages. And they did that, they attributed their existence to the Middle Ages just at the moment when many nation states were rising on the ruins of old monarchies and empires, rising from what they thought of as the darkness and despotism of the past. So anything that didn't fit the image of the new and non-despotic present was put into a big box of otherness and labeled medieval. It's easy to disparage people who are long dead and gone and can't defend themselves. And that's why I've chosen to defend them. Being a historian is tremendous fun for a lot of different reasons. It's fun because I get to do puppetry and crafts projects with my students. It's also fun because I get to take human self-mythologizing and other nonsense and soak it in the acid bath of evidence and reason. So here are some other myths about the Middle Ages. All Jews lived in ghettos. No, actually, no Jews lived in ghettos in the Middle Ages. 
The first ghettos in history were founded in Europe in the 16th century. Some Jews did live in Europe in the medieval period and endured plenty of persecution by the Christian church, although in many cases, the church also protected the Jews. In the period that I study, up until about 1300, the vast majority of Jews on the planet Earth lived not in Christian Europe, but in the Muslim world parts of the world. It turns out we know more about the Jews of medieval Cairo than Jews of any other period before 1300 because of a single cache of documents that was unearthed in a medieval synagogue. This is what's known as the Cairo Geniza. So when I introduced myself as director of the Geniza lab, I've devoted myself for the last 25 years to documents, specifically documentary texts, letters, legal texts, lists, accounts, all kinds of ephemera that were never meant for preservation that were preserved in this medieval synagogue. Sometimes they're very difficult to decipher. So a lot of what I do with graduate students is sit around trying to puzzle out the difficult script and sometimes very difficult language. With undergrads, I like to share the translations, although surprisingly, I mean, to my great delight, many Princeton undergrads have come to me with either excellent Hebrew or excellent Arabic or both. It's quite wonderful to discover that. What's amazing about there being so many documents, we're looking at probably about 40,000 Nobody's counted yet. That's kind of the wonderful thing is that these documents were discovered to exist in the late 19th century and we're still going through them. There aren't enough of us with, you know, the the patience to sit and do it. That's an invitation, by the way. And so 40,000 is just an estimate at this point in a much larger cache of about 400,000 pages or fragments of pages. So a lot of those texts are like, you know, copies of the Bible, rabbinic literature, lots and lots of medical manuscripts. Anyone who's interested in the history of medicine would have a field day with this stuff. But I study the documents. In fact, for decades in both of the fields that I work in, Jewish history and Middle Eastern history, people were trained to read mostly fine literature while ignoring daily life. They were trained to understand religion by reading what jurists and other religious experts wanted people to do, as opposed to observing, say, audiences at street theater performances. So when historians open their eyes to the potential of history from below, the narrative starts to change. People who lived a thousand years ago were no more pious than us, even if their pieties were different from ours, and they were certainly no more violent. Recognizing that is a first step to understanding the past, and it can also be a step toward creating a better future.